In this video, we are going to talk about articulations between the bones of the skull, the temporomandibular joint, and the edge features. Uh, we will talk more about the skull of the newborn. Right, so this is the last part in topic 13 and 14. Right, so you need to watch uh, those videos in this topic. Click the um, link on the top right corner. There is a playlist there. Right, or towards the end of this video, I will show you a playlist again with all the videos of the topics we covered so far. Okay, so let's begin. Starting with the articulations of the bones of the skull. Right, so in the previous video, I told you in general information about bones and articulations. Right, I told you that there are three main stages. Right, uh, I said there is a syndesmosis, a synchondrosis synostosis right so if you remember what that means please uh, make sure you type the definitions in the comment section right or but if you haven't watched that, those videos you can click the link on the top right corner uh, there is a playlist the whole uh, anatomy topics and their order according to the uh, syllabus we are using in ukraine Right. Okay. Uh, back to our story. Right. So the articulations of the bones of the skull are in, we can say, three groups. There is syndesmosis, consisting of sutures and fondanels, synchondrosis, the cartilage, and diarthrosis, the true joint. Right. So syndesmosis in the skull, there are sutures, a lot of sutures. Right. So those sutures are found in the adult skull. The fondanels are actually special these are like these main gaps which are found in the skull of the newborn we'll talk more about them towards the end of this video synchondrosis right so in the base of the skull they are synchondrosis uh, is like fibrous cartilage lodged in the fissures between the bones the synchondrosis in the base of the skull are uh, remnants of cartilaginous tissue in which the bones of the base of the skull develop from. Uh, and uh, this synchondrosis is actually associated with uh, the functions of the base of the skull, thus um, support, protection, and movement. There is only one true joint. Diarthrosis is a paired joint called the temporomandibular joint. Right, so we'll talk more about it later, right? Right. The types of sutures of the skull. Right, so we talked about these sutures a lot, right? So this is just a review, right? So they, uh, they are serrated sutures, squamous sutures, plain sutures, right? I didn't mention gomphosis, like this articulation between the uh, alveolar processes and the teeth. Right. So serrated sutures. For example, almost all the bones forming the valve of the skull, with the exception of one, like the squamous part of the temporal bone, articulate by means of serrated suture. Right. So for squamous suture, squamous suture mainly find this uh, on the articulation of the what of the parietal bone and the squamous part of the temporal bone, that's the sutura squamosa. Plain suture, sutura plana, for example, the bones of the uh, visceral skull, they fit together at relatively smooth borders to form a plain suture. And these sutures are, are designated by names of the two articulating bones, right? For example, sutura sphenofrontalis, is the suture uh, between the sphenoid bone and the frontal bone, or the uh, sutura sphenoparietalis, the articulation between the sphenoid bone and the parietal bone, etc. Synchondrosis, right? So synchondrosis are divided into two groups according to time, right? That's the kind of uh, classification we are using here, right? So there are temporary synchondrosis and permanent synchondrosis. Temporary synchondrosis exists only uh, to a definite age, and after that, they are replaced by synostosis, right? So uh, these temporal synchondrosis are the second phase of skeletal development. And an example of this temporal 
synchondrosis is sphenooccipital synchondrosis, right? The synchondrosis between the sphenoid bone, the bone of the sphenoid, and the basilar part of the occipital bone. So that is the sphenooccipital synchondrosis. Permanent synchondrosis is permanent, exists throughout life, right? A very good example is a sphenopetrosal synchondrosis, the synchondrosis between the sphenoid bone and the petrous part of the temporal bone, right? Synchondrosis, sphenopetrosa. And the petrooccipital synchondrosis, the synchondrosis between the petrous part um, of the temporal bone and the occipital bone, right? And the petrooccipital synchondrosis, right? So this is the synchondrosis between the petrous part of the temporal bone, again, and the occipital bone. Synchondrosis, petrooccipitalis. All right, now let's talk about the temporal mandibular joint. Right, the Latin name is Articulatio Temporomandibularis. Right, so uh, this joint is formed by the head of the mandible, caput mandibule, and the mandibular fossa, fossa mandibularis, and the articular tubercle, the tuberculum articulare of the temporal bone. Right, so it's an articulation between which two bones, the mandible and the uh, temporal bone. Right. The articular capsule is attached along the border of the mandibular fossa up to the petrotympanic fissure and thus encloses the articular tubercle and embraces the neck of the mandible inferiorly. Right, so um, this is the temporal mandibular joint, right? So you can see the mandibular fossa here, right? So this is the temporal bone and this is the... Uh, head of the mandible and this is the joint you can see in green there is uh, the articular disc is very important anteriorly you can see oh i didn't give you the orientation guys this is the back part this is anterior how do i how do you see that see this uh mastoid process right it's found on the back right so this is the articular uh tubercle tuberculum articulare Right, so it prevents anterior dislocation of this joint. Right, um, right. This is important. I will talk about it later. But you can see that uh, this articular disc is dividing uh, this joint into two compartments: the upper part and the lower part. Right, it's very important. You will see. Right, what are the characteristics of this joint? Right, firstly, it's a complex joint. Articulatio complessa, right? The articulating surfaces are complemented with a fibrous articular disc, discus articularis between them. And the edges of the disc are joined to the articular capsule as a result of which the joint cavity is separated into two compartments. Right, this is a combined joint, right? Combined, there are two, right? Two separate but working together. Right, so the both temporomandibular joints function simultaneously and are therefore a single combined articulation from the mechanical standpoint. It is also a condyloid joint, articulatio condylaris. Right, the temporomandibular articulation is a condyloid joint, but because of the articular disc, it permits movement in three directions. Right. We will talk about uh, the movements. Right. First movement is the downward and upward movement uh, with opening and closure of the mouth. That's the first movement. The second movement is uh, forward and backward movement. And the last one is a lateral movement. Right. So uh, this is the rotation of the mandible to the right and to the left. And this kind of movement takes place during chewing. Right, okay, so let's start with the first movement, the downward and upward movements with the opening and closing of the mouth. These movements have two phases. The first phase of these movements uh, is made in the lower compartment of the joint between the, that's the, between the articular disc and the articular head. To open the mouth wide, the head glides forward and down 
uh, with the disc into the articular tubercles that prevents the dislocation of the jaw. And the movement in the second phase will take place in the upper compartment of the joint. Next is the forward and backward movements. Right. So these movements occur in the upper compartment of the joint and the head glides forward and downwards with the disc into the articular tubercle. Next is the lateral movements during chewing. Right. So in lateral movements, the articular head and disc of only one side leaves the articular fossa and approach the articular tubercle. Right. So this movement, it, it takes place in the upper compartment of the joint. While the contralateral on the other side, remains in the articular fossa and rotates on the vertical axis, right? So this happens in the lower compartment of the joint. Let's talk about the ligaments of the temporomandibular joint, right? So the first one is the lateral ligament, right? You can see it here. That's the lateral ligament, ligamentum laterale, right? Uh, this is the, right, so this is an external view. This is an internal view, right? So uh, on this view, I also want to show you these ligaments. The first one, you see this process is called the styloid process, right? So the ligament is stylomandibular because it's attaching to the uh, to this angle of the mandible, stylomandibular ligament, this ligament, right? If you move a little bit anteriorly, you see this ligament, right? It's attaching from the... Uh, like from the board of the sphenoid to the lingula of the mandibular, right? So this ligament is called uh, the sphenomandibular ligament, ligamentum sphenomandibulare, right? So it's, so those are the main ligaments, right? Um, you can see them here, right? So uh, ligamentum stylomandibular, right? Okay. Nerves and vessels. The joint, uh, this temporomandibular joint, is supplied with nutrients uh, by the maxillary artery, right? So this is the maxillary artery, right? So you can see this is the joint, the joint capsule. So it's giving uh, like a uh, blood supply here. The venous blood drains into the venous network called rete articular mandibule, right? So there is a venous aplexus around around this uh, uh, temporomandibular joint, right? And it will drain into uh, a retromandibular vein, right? We will talk about it later in uh, vascular system, right? In blood vessels. The lymph drains along the deep lymphatic nodes into the uh, lymphatic nodes of the parotid gland right node lymphatis parotid day and then they will drain into the deep cervical nodes innovation uh so this joint is innervated by the auricular temporal nerve right so this is uh is from the third branch of the trigeminal nerve right that's the mandibular nerve right it's a sensory nerve. We will talk about the nerves later. Don't worry. But you can, right, you, you can remember this. One is supplied by the what? Maxillary artery. Two, uh, just to say it drains, like finally, I mean the lymphatic uh, tissue into the uh, deep cervical uh, lymph nodes and innervation by the auriculotemporal nerve, right? It's a, sens uh, it's a sensory nerve. Okay, let's continue. Edge features of the skull, right? Starting with the skull of the newborn, right? So it have uh, like uh, four specific features. Firstly, uh, the visceral cranium is a uh, small as compared to the cerebral part, right? So the big, uh, this this part is bigger than this lower part. Okay, right. Let's see why. The different uh, muscular tuberosities 
muscular crests and lines are not pronounced yet because the muscles do not function. And therefore, uh, these uh, tuberosities and crests are weakly developed. The weakness of muscles due to the absence of masticating function causes weak development of the jaws. The alveolar process are hard, processes are hardly formed and the mandible consists of two non-united halves. As a result, the visceral cranium is less prominent in relation to cerebral skull and is only 1 as to 8. 1 for the visceral and 8 for the one for the cerebral part right but in adults it's 1 is to 4 right in adult skull is 1 is to 4 but in newborn is 1 is to 8 the second specific features are fontanelles right so I like to name fonticule right so these are these large spaces found between the uh, the bones of the uh, vault, right? The fontanelles are remnants of the first membranous stage and they occur at the intersection of sutures where remnants of non-ossified connective tissue are found. Their presence is of high functional importance because they permit bones of the vault of the skull to be displaced considerably as the skull adapts to the shape and size of the birth canal during delivery, right? So they permit this movement. That's the greatest importance, right? During birth. And then later, we can check the growth using those fontanelles again, as you are going to see, because as time goes on, they disappear uh, in specific periods one by one, right? So uh, this is the anterior view, right? So anterior view, Let's uh, look at uh, these fontanelles, right? So let's just go down and uh, this these labels, right? So number one is uh, mental synthesis, uh, okay? So my case, I cannot go down there, but if you look at number one down there, you see uh, the synthesis mentalis. Or number two, right, on the sides, you can see the mental tubercle, tuberculum mentale. And on number three, uh, down here, uh, just below my kesa, down there, you see this foramen, right? It's called foramen mentale, right? So number four, where is number four? Number four is this, is just this bone, the maxillae. Number five uh, is the angle, right? The angle of the mandible here, right? Or number five. Number six is the fossa canina. Canine fossa, fossa canina. Number seven is uh, foramen zygomatico faciale, this one. Number eight um, is the zygomatic bone or zygomaticum, here. Number nine, there is, um, okay, so this is number nine. There is the squamous part of the temporal bone, pars squamosa osis temporalis. Or number ten, this is the orbit, orbiter. Number 11, uh, where is number 11? Here is the uh, supraorbital notch, incisura supraorbitalis. Number 12 is the parietal bone, os parietale. Um, number 13, here down there, you see the is a uh, supranasal fontanel, fonticulus supranasalis. And on number 14, you have uh, this fontanel, very important, is the anterior fontanel, right? Fonticulus anterior. This one is very important. So in, I mean, in an adult skull, this will be called the uh, the bregma, this region. It's called the bregma. That's where these uh, bones articulate. Because the frontal will be a single bone and two parietal. So this is where the bregma will be found between the articulation of those three points two parietal plus one frontal right now where were we oh, okay well now on number 15 ponticulus metopicus on number 16 um uh right this one right so this prominence to prominent tubers is called a tuba frontale 
and on number 17 is the nasal bone os nasale number 18 uh here is number 18 is a lacrimal bone os lacrimale um on number 19 we have um superior orbital fissure right where is it here right superior orbital fissure fissura orbitale superior and uh, on number 20 here you have the uh, zygomatic process of the frontal bone processus zygomaticus osis frontalis or number 21 here right so number 21 is the this fissure inferiorly right the inferior orbital fissure fissura orbitalis inferior or number 22 here right or number 22 is this a natural uh, uh, is piriform aperture this opening right uh, apertura piriformis or number 23 uh, this is number 23 here right so number 23 is um infraorbital foramen right Be below the orbit infraorbital foramen foramen infraorbital right or number 24 number 24 here is the nasal septum septum nasi Number 25 is the this anterior spine, the spina nasalis anterior. And on number 26 is the alveoli, right? Um, okay, so you can see down below the case is the alveoli of the mandible. But here, this is the alveoli of the maxilla, right? Okay, right. So that was the front of view. This is the lateral view, right? So, okay, we can go through it again. Right. So, um, okay, I, I, I'm not going to mention all, all these levels, right? You just take time, right? So you can open your book and uh, see these levels, right? So uh, here on number 20, on number 20, you can see this comma is part of the temporal bone here, right? On number 23 here, this one is the parietal uh, tuba, right? Tuba parietale, right? This is the anterior on, on number 21 is the anterior fontanel. Um, what else? Right. This on number 25 is very important. Is the mastoid fontanel. Right. Fonticulus mastoidus. Right. There is another one on the back. Okay. Let me show you another few. All right. So, okay. So, this on number 25, the mastoid fontanel, it closes in the second or third month of life right okay so this is the superior view and on number nine you can see uh like no on number seven that's the anterior fontanel here is the posterior fontanel here it will form the lambdoid suture if you remember right right so this fontanel this uh occipital fontanel or posterior fontanel it closes in the second month after birth right okay so you are, for other labels you can just um open your book and just to revise all of them but i just mentioned the most important ones right right the third feature uh, actually the remnants of the second cartilaginous uh, stage of development right so as a result uh, you know, the number of bones in a newborn are greater than the uh, number of bones in the adult. For example, the occipital bone, all right? So in adults, it's just a, a single bone. But in in a newborn, it's four parts which will just fuse uh, between the age of three and six, right? The frontal bone and the mandible, they are not fused uh, in a newborn. But in adults, they are fused. It's one bone, right? Then uh, the fusion of both halves of the frontal bone at the side of the frontal suture occurs only about two years of age here. The metopic, uh, metopic fonticulus. It closes around um, two years and the frontal bone will become one. Then both halves of the mandibles fuse to form a single bone only between the age of one and two right so here there is uh this one 
it's called what this suture uh, on mental suture like uh, between the the two halves right so it will close around the age of one and two years the fourth feature is the absence of air sinuses in the skull of the newborn right the air sinuses in the skull of the a newborn are absent they are not developed right so the first one the frontal sinus this one is detected on a radiograph at the end of the first year of life after which it grows gradually the maxillary sinus is demonstrated on the radiograph of the skull at birth as an elongated clear space of a size of a p and it reaches full development in the period of replacement of deciduous teeth by the permanent teeth and is distinguished by great variability. The sphenoid sinus, uh, so the sphenoid sinus is very small in a newborn and it will start to grow rapidly only after seven years of life. The bony cells of the ethmoid bones are already uh, discernible in the first life right so you can actually see them after a year right about the periods of growth uh, three periods of growth are distinguished in the skull right the first period is the first seven years this period is characterized by intensive growth and this occurs mainly on the posterior part right after seven years that will be the second period from uh, seven years to the beginning of puberty. This period is known as the period of relative rest. There is no uh, rapid growth in the uh, size of the skull. But after that, I mean, the third period from the beginning of puberty around 13 to 16 years to the end of skeletal growth around uh, 20 to 23, this period is also known as the period of intensive growth but in this case only uh, is focusing mainly on the anterior part right first seven years posterior part and then from seven to around 16 relative arrest and then from there until around 20 to 23 years this is uh, is rapid growth again but mainly focusing on the anterior part Right, so that is everything, uh, okay, almost everything you need to know about the skull of the newborn, right? So let's look at the skull at old age, right? So there are three main features you need to remember, right? If you talk about the skull at old age, right? Number one, at mature age, the cranial sutures disappear, they obliterate because the syndesmosis between the bones of the vault are converted into synostosis. That's number one, disappearance of the sutures. Number two, at old age, the bones of the skull are often thinner and lighter. They become thin and lighter. Number three, is a result of loss of teeth, right? So at old age, people lose teeth. It's normal, right? So, because of loss of teeth and atrophy of the alveolar margins of both the upper and lower jaws, the face becomes shorter and the lower jaw protrudes forward, while the angle formed by the ramus and the body increases, right? So, this angle will, what? will increase, right? The angulus mandibuli. Right, thank you so much. If you like this video, please make sure you give it a thumbs up. Uh, and if you feel like we are giving uh, good information, you can also subscribe and share with your friends so that you won't miss any of our latest videos. Until next time, folks.